I want to bring in Dr. Ayaz Patan, who spent weeks in Gaza recently, helping in emergency and triage, saving lives, witnessing the terrible cost of this war firsthand. He grew up in the Triangle, studied to be a doctor here in North Carolina, currently lives now in Cary. Dr. Patan, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you for having me. I do want to start with a, a picture that you shared with me, and this was of an, an Israeli soldier at a checkpoint pointing a mounted machine gun at your vehicle while another soldier questioned your driver. You also showed me some pictures of explosions that you took with your phone. Tell me a bit about the dangers that you encountered working in a war zone. Yeah, so I, I wasn't completely prepared for um, some of the violence that I saw, which really sounds foolish because I knew I was going into a war zone. But um, in, in a lot of ways, uh, the hospitals that we're in are deconflicted areas, and we sort of expected um, safe travel to these areas um, and between these areas. But I, I will say I didn't totally find that to be the case. Um, and, and my first lesson was immediately entering Gaza, which is the first picture that you showed, um, immediately passing the checkpoint within a couple of minutes. We were stopped by several soldiers on, a, on an armed vehicle, um, and we were acted as if we were a threat immediately. Um, we were asked to show our credentials, that we were doctors, despite the fact that we just passed a checkpoint um, and uh, essentially allowed to travel after that, but not after quite a bit of delay and, and whatnot. Um, the highest risk areas I felt were any time that we were traveling outside of the hospital. Now, certainly even within the hospitals, I'll tell you that my hospital that I was at in the North, we got evacuation orders um, where they told us that this would be an area of military um, engagement or action and that we needed to evacuate the hospital. Thankfully, the Red Cross, Red Crescent, was able to mark us as a safe zone. We did not have to evacuate. Um, but in all of the movements that we had, we certainly had um, situations that we were concerned about. We had ongoing bombing that we were, bombings that we were um, dealing with and hearing and feeling most of the times that we were there. You talked about your travel. So um, within Gaza, there are millions of Palestinians have fled to southern Gaza, but hundreds of thousands stayed in the north in their homes there. And this is where most of the bombings have have happened, leveling in some in some cases entire cities. You did travel there. You were telling me a bit uh, before this interview. We, were, we, had, we talked for a bit and you told me about your journey there through that rubble and the threat of being killed. Can you explain some of that? Yeah, so what I did find is that when we got to the north, the devastation and destruction was far more than what we saw in the south, which is really difficult to say because as I was taking pictures through the south, I kept thinking to myself that the the destruction cannot get worse. And after four or 500 pictures and videos that I'd taken, I realized that, yeah, it does get worse. And especially when I got to the north, um, there was a period of time when we were trying to travel from the north uh, back to the south. Um, again, we had checked a uh, past a military checkpoint stopped by soldiers similar to the ones that uh, you saw in the picture. And we were asked to show our credentials again, um, despite the fact that we had passed a, um, a checkpoint where they verified our passport and all of these things. Um, and we were warned by the soldier that we're traveling on a road that they consider dangerous, that from this point on, nobody is going to check our credentials. They're not going to check that we are doctors. They're not going to check that we are Americans. They're not going to check our passport. His exact words were that if you slow down, if you go too fast, if you turn off of this road, you will be targeted as a threat. Um, and, and what I'll say is that our, our driver who is uh, from Gaza, who's made this trip many, many times, um, you could tell the anxiety on his, on his face and his actions. Um, that he held our lives in his hand based on how he was driving, the roads that he was staying on. Um, so I'll tell you, that was one time that I really felt um, that this could be it. Can you explain what that road is like? Because from what I understand, much of that area has been destroyed, that there are bridges that are out, that sometimes it is impossible to stay on that specific road. And um, I'm sure that the driver, that you were unclear as to whether or not you'd be able to, to listen to the direction you were given. Yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, the driver knew that the road that we were traveling in Orange Hole to stay on had a, a bridge that was out. 
um, and that had been out for several weeks because of destruction, we specifically asked the soldier about that bridge, what do we do when we approach it? And he said he's not sure of the condition of the road, he just knows we need to stay on the road. Um, and, and that just goes to show you that I think he probably works on that checkpoint, but he doesn't travel around. I mean, quite honestly, it's not not safe even for an Israeli soldier, I would assume, um, to be in that area unless they're part of the ongoing military operation. So um, outside of just that and that bridge, all of the roads had destruction. It was all, all rubble um, going at even probably 20 miles per hour was probably going too fast. How tense of a, of, a, of a journey was that, especially when you had to get around that area where the bridge was out? Yeah, it was it was tense. And I, I could tell you that um, it was pin drop silence in our vehicle where we had um, a, a French um, physician along with three um, American physicians with us. Um, and I think we all knew, we understood the gravity. I think the, um, the soldier repeated three times that you will be targeted as a threat if any of those things happened. Um, and, and quite honestly, uh, we've heard stories of um, whoever it may be, World Central Kitchen, um, United Nations World Food Program, having permission to travel on roads and still having um, to deal with bombings, um, military action involving um, gunshots, things of, the, things of that nature. So um, as you can imagine, we were concerned that we were being warned very um, intently that this is a possibility for us. I want to take a moment and play a video that you took on your phone. This was after a bombing. It shows some of the chaos in the emergency room. Let's, let's take a moment and take a look at that. When I, when I see videos like the one you took, um, it always strikes me that there may not be the resources to to, to be able to care for people in that dire of a situation following that traumatic of, a, of, a, of an incident. Can you explain the resources that are there and what it takes to care for people after a bombing? Yeah, so having worked in several um, trauma centers in the, um, the United States, several of them level one trauma centers, um, I'll tell you that uh, the resources there are um, a fraction, as all of you can already imagine, uh, of, of what we have here in the United States. I think what was really devastating to me was the fact that that incident was repeated three, four times a day. Um, the thing that would strike anybody that works in healthcare or not is the number of patients that were on the floor, right? That um, we did not even have enough stretchers really um, to be able to accommodate patients. Uh, the toughest part for me is especially when there were um, multiple patients and as you know, half of the population is high school age or younger, so a lot of them are children, and having to make decisions that I would not make in this country. I would absolutely be able to um, get somebody to the operating room, be able to resuscitate them, give them a chance to live, but instead, in that situation, have to um, you know, pull them to the corner and in some cases, not even be able to give them pain medicine if we didn't have it, um, just knowing that here, they're not gonna survive, and we have another dozen patients that have a higher chance of survival that we need to really focus our resources on. As someone who grew up in the United States, studied in the United States, and you're now experiencing this war zone and making those types of, of, of choices, how, how is it that you can cope with that? Is it difficult? Yeah, it, it's absolutely difficult. I, I will openly admit that there are many nights more often than not when I was there during my three weeks stay that I silently cried um, just thinking about what I had seen um, and, and quite honestly just the inability to do what I felt I needed to do to help the people um, but I knew that in, in a room full of um, you know almost a dozen other doctors that were sleeping in these bunk beds that the vascular surgeon, the plastic surgeon, the trauma surgeon, the pediatric doctor, all of them had the same experience that very day about not being able to be good enough um, to do what they needed to. I'm then also reminded that a lot of the doctors there um, have been going through this for almost a year now. Um, and so uh, as I process some of the um, mental trauma, so to speak, that I've, um, 
felt, I know that they don't have time to process it. They just have to wake up the next day and um, move on. I want to ask you about two other photos that you sent me. One is a photo that shows three boys sitting in the dirt outside of a building that's damaged and charred from bombs. Only one of the three is even wearing shoes, and they're leaning on each other, kind of hands on each other's legs, comforting one another. The other photo shows a tent built out of rubble that looks like a market or something. They're selling food and snacks there or giving them away. In the background, there are kids standing on a collapsed building playing with what looks like a, a, a kite that I imagine they may have even made. Can you tell me about these very sad and poetic moments that you were able to capture with your phone with these photographs and, and what impression that they have, they have left on you? Yeah, I think in the first photo, um, what, it, what it showed me and what I've learned is that the people are tired. Um, they don't have resources. Um, you know, they don't have shoes, quite honestly. One of the things you'll find if anybody that goes there um, with the humanitarian effort is you leave everything. Um, you leave your shoes, you leave your clothes, you leave your scrubs, you leave your toothpaste, whatever you've brought with you, you, you leave. Um, really, other than the clothes on my back, um, my own passport, I left with a single missile shrapnel um, that, I had, that I'd taken when the paramedics had brought in um, a bombing victim. Uh, and, and it's just a reminder to me that, um, you know, this, this piece of shrapnel, I play a part in here in this country, you know, maybe uh, in a political way um, that I know where that missile was, was manufactured. I know where some of the funding for it came. Um, but I think that, that what you see with those kids leaning on each other is, again, they're tired. I think what a lot of folks have told me is they expected this to go on a month, maybe a month and a half. That's all that they've ever really known in the past. Um, and now I've seen that people have been displaced from their their permanent home to a, um, a refugee camp and then displaced from there to another refugee camp, each time um, leaving all the things that they thought they needed. Um, and in some cases, even leaving their family with some families separated from the, the north-south border um, in the second picture, uh, I think it's a reminder of the resilience of the people. And, and that is something that I really um, sometimes feel that I, I took from them and um, they gave me. So I, I, I'd like to think that I, I was able to provide support um, both medically, emotionally, but I think in a lot of ways they provided me with a new perspective on life. Um, and, and again, seeing those kids in that type of situation um, and still being kids was something that really um, was moving for me. Um, and it made me think about my own kids. It made me think about the situation they're in. Um, and it really got me to get up every day um, and many nights to um, go down and help because I thought that's what it was about, the people. Dr. Patan, thank you so much. We appreciate you taking some time to speak with us. Thank you, appreciate it.